Chess friends, I hope you are doing well. Today, I am very excited to show you my recent chess tournament game against Ruby Chess. In this game, I initiated my g4 opening strategy to launch a heavy attack on the king side. By sacrificing my rook, I got the opportunity to expose the black king. It was a delicious and mind-blowing game. I will teach you the opening strategies chess tactics and strategies, so, let's get started without wasting any time, I started the game with e4, at this point, he could play either d6 or e5, both of which are viable moves, he could also play the French variation in the opening, however, he decided to go with d5, which is called the Scandinavian defense, after I captured, many players are tempted to play knight to f6 or even capture the pawn on the d5 square which was actually played in the game. After knight c3, the queen went to a5, in the game, you can see that my strategy with knight c3 involves placing the bishop on c4 by moving my pawn to d3, followed by knight to f3, I could also consider playing pawn to d4 and developing the bishop to f4, which is a good move to bring out the queen and prepare for castling. I start with d4, and there's an amazing chess trap you can use, it begins with playing pawn to b4, forcing the queen to capture the pawn. Next, you can follow up with knight to b5, attacking the pawn on c7, a natural move for black is to protect the pawn with queen to a5, but then comes the bishop on c4. This exerts pressure on the queen side, prompting some players to consider a6 to kick out the knight, however, there's a secret trap, capturing the pawn on f7, sacrificing the bishop, if black doesn't take the bishop and simply moves the king to d8, it leaves the pieces undeveloped and unable to castle. If black captures the bishop on f7, queen to h5 check becomes dangerous, after g6, I can play knight to d6, threatening both the queen and king. Even if black moves the king to e6 or f6, I can check with the knight on d4 or bishop to b2, leading to a lost queen on a5. Black will face vulnerability around his king side. But, in the actual game, instead of playing before, I decided to go with the d4 move to provide an open diagonal for the bishop and start with knight f3, after ruby played pawn to c6, it became evident that he wants to create extra lines for the queen, he intends to play knight to d7 to potentially break open the structure by pushing the pawn on either c5 or e5, with the protection of the knight, which is a viable and logical consideration. At this point, he needs to play e6, followed by knight to f6, and then bishop e7 to establish a strong structure and prepare for a short side castle, a few moves later, when I played bishop to e2 and his queen moved back to d7, I moved my bishop to c4 to attack the pawn on f7, knight g5 is also in progress to strengthen the attack, prompting him to try to block it with pawn to e6, however. I can further attack his structure by playing knight to g5 and potentially invade with my queen by playing queen to e2. The pawn on e6 is under pressure from the bishop, queen, and the possibility of the knight coming to g5 to attack the structure, consequently, ruby decided to reinforce with bishop to e7, after I play a4, black castles, at this point, some might consider short side castling, while others might opt for long side castling, as a god of chess, I always lean towards attacking moves, so I initiate the attack by pushing my pawn to h4, setting up potential g4 g5, and h5 attacking plans to disrupt your king side completely, the ruby chess faces its toughest challenge yet as my bishop and knight have open diagonals, and my queen can potentially join the attack on g4, additionally, the knight can come to e5 to weaken your structure further, after knight a6 in the game, Black aims to play pawn to c5 to open the c-file, but I stick to my plan with pawn to g4, part of my opening strategy. And at this point, some of you might be tempted to capture the unprotected pawn on g4, but my long side castling sets up rook g1 to control the open file, if you try moving the knight back to f6 or play pawn to h5, both moves can be burden and dumbass, moving the knight back invites a cunning sacrifice with rook takes g7, sacrificing the rook for a significant positional advantage, because no one can sacrifice like stockfish, after capturing the rook, the other rooks join the party on the g1 file. When the king moves back, my knight lands on the e5 square, attacking the f7 pawn, 
while the bishop positions itself on h6 to reposition your rook, this allows me to capture the f7 pawn easily, leading to a checkmating position. Therefore, pawn takes d4 is not possible due to bishop takes h6, after the rook moves, capturing the f7 pawn leads to checkmate. So let me share a beautiful quote with you. You can choose to believe you are the best of what you think you are instead of believing you're the worst of what they say you are. Returning to the position, the best move here is to consider bishop to d6 to try to kick out the knight, however, I can play a cunning move by playing knight to b5, attacking both the queen and the bishop simultaneously, after the queen moves, captures, and recaptures occur, I can play bishop to h6, repositioning your rook, simultaneously, bishop to g7 is supported by the rook, threatening checkmate on f7, rendering the rook immobile. The game will be over so returning to the current position, some may be tempted to play pawn to h5 to protect the knight, but that move meets knight to b5, attacking the queen, as the queen moves, another knight lands on e5, attacking the knight on g4 and the knight on f6 simultaneously, capturing the knight on e5 would create a disastrous position, once again, I can sacrifice my rook on g7, showing its significant role, after you capture it, I can play queen takes e5, leaving your king in a vulnerable position, unable to move freely, if king h7 happens, rook to g1 brings a checkmating threat in one move, if you try to protect that square, I can still checkmate by capturing the pawn on h5, resulting in a 200 elo rated checkmate, Returning to the position, both knight takes g4 and h6 are not possible due to potential g5 moves, ruby attacks by playing knight to b4, targeting the c2 pawn, instead of longside castling to protect the pawn. Black executes a stronger attack with pawn to b5, attacking both pieces. To maintain my advantages and attacking potential, I opt for pawn to g5, directly targeting the knight, with my knight active in the center and king side, Rook g1 sets up potential attacks. After black captures c2 and the rook on a1, I sacrifice my rook, leading to a decisive advantage as the knight is trapped and unable to move back. At this juncture, black might be tempted to play pawn to g6 to establish a king's Indian defensive pawn structure, however, I disrupt your position by playing knight to e4, attacking the bishop and weakening the pawn structure. Some might consider playing bishop to e7, but it's risky as my knight can freely move to g5. If you respond with pawn to h6, I can execute a powerful attack by playing queen to e4, threatening checkmate in one move, to counter this threat, you'd have to block with pawn to g6, but then another knight can come to e5, further pressuring the structure and threatening to capture on g6, after the exchange of knights and recapture on the board, the h-file opens up, allowing my queen to reach h4 and potentially deliver checkmate in just a few moves. Returning to the position, instead of bishop to e7, ruby, a tactical master, decides to move his bishop back to d8, however, this decision burdens the position and weakens it further, as all pieces and the structure become passive, meanwhile, my pieces, along with the bishop and two knights in the center of the board, create a problematic situation for the black king. With the rook potentially coming to g1 and the queen accessing this diagonal, black faces significant challenges, rook g1 attacks the pawn on g7, after black initiates his plan by playing pawn to b5 attacking the bishop on c4, it's clear that ruby is aiming for pawn exchanges on b5 and potentially invading the queen for attacking chances on c2 along with the knight. To counter this, I attack the pawn on g7 with my rook and bishop by playing bishop to h6, Black must block the attack by playing pawn to g6, but this weakens his king's side. I disrupt his position further by playing pawn to h5, attacking the g6 pawn. Simultaneously, I move my bishop back to d3 and position my knight on e5 to further pressure the g6 pawn. The rook can also potentially sacrifice itself on g6. After bishop d3, he decides to play pawn to c5, aiming to open the c-file for his rook and develop his bishop on b7, to disrupt his pawn structure and expose the black king, I play pawn to h5, he responds by capturing the pawn on d4, at this point, with my king in the center and no castling done, I make a supernatural and brilliant move, can you guess what it is? 
Take a moment to think about it before continuing. The move, which you may not have imagined in your whole life, is knight to d6, what a brilliant and astonishing move it is. Capturing the knight isn't easy, as I can capture your pawn on g6, even if you capture the pawn, I can sacrifice my bishop on g6 to open up the rook file. After the recapture with my rook, your king is forced to move. When the king moves to f7, I can play rook to g7 check. This sets up my attack, with my queen capturing on b5, you'd have to block with your bishop, and your position is under significant pressure. After I play queen to h5, my queen is strategically attacking the black king, it leads to a checkmate in just one move after rook f7, queen takes f7, the game is over, and the position is busted. Returning to the position, we see that queen takes t6 is not possible, instead, after bishop to f6 to protect the dark square diagonal, and captures occur in the game, the bishop effectively guards the king's side square, therefore, rook takes g6 or bishop takes g6 are not viable, I begin a higher plan by playing queen to e4, attacking the g6 pawn and the rook on a8 simultaneously, regardless of your move, it provides decisive advantages for me, whether you play bishop to d7 or move your rook from b8. For instance, if you decide to play rook to b8, then I can execute a higher plan by sacrificing my rook on the g6 square, this rook sacrifice creates a violent and dangerous situation for the black king, with the knight applying much pressure on the king's side, and the queen and bishop adding to the pressure, after the captures and recaptures on the board, your king has to move to h8, at this point, I can launch an even stronger and heavier attack, can you guess that move? Try to figure it out by pausing the video, if you dare to find the move, it's knight to e8, what an astonishing and wonderful move it is. You cannot capture the knight on e8 because queen takes e8 leads to checkmate, the bishops guard the square, and the knight also attacks the queen on c7, if you try to safeguard your king by playing queen to f7, I can sacrifice my bishop on g7, forcing you to capture with your bishop, then queen h7 leads to checkmate with the bishop and queen, giving me a decisive advantage. So let me tell you a beautiful life quote in sudden. Learn to accept rather than expect, and you'll have far fewer disappointments. Returning to the position, we see that both bishop d7 and rook b8 isn't viable which is why Ruby decided to go with bishop b7, he sacrifices his bishop on the b7 square to force me to capture his bishop with my knight, which is far away from the d6 square where the knight could create potential attacking chances for the black king, this strategic move by Ruby Chase involved sacrificing his bishop, after knight b3, he played to give freedom to the knight, when I capture the pawn on b5. You can see that rook takes g6 could be a threat, after bishop g7 in the game, he tried to activate his rook and queen simultaneously. However, I captured the pawn on the e6 square, checking the king, you can see that queen to f7 is not viable because if you do so, I can easily capture your queen on f7, regardless of whether you capture it with the rook or queen. I can play bishop to c4, attacking your knight and rook simultaneously. Returning to the position, we saw that queen to f7 is not possible, after king to h8 in the game, I captured the bishop on g7, after the recapture on the board, the king becomes exposed and vulnerable. Therefore, I can execute a higher plan by sacrificing one of my pieces on the g6 square, however, you can see that the knight on f3 is also under attack. I decided to initiate a heavier attack by sacrificing my bishop on the g6 square, this move aims to open up my file for the rook, you cannot recapture my bishop with your pawn because queen takes g6 could lead to a checkmate situation in just a few moves, after the king moves back to a8, I capture your knight on b3, gaining material and securing an advantageous position, if you decide to capture the knight on b7, it will create a dangerous and challenging position for you, as I can play knight to e5, creating vulnerability around your king's side, the knight, bishop, along with the king's rook, apply significant pressure on the black king, after black captures on f2, I can easily play queen to g3, attacking the rook. After the rook and bishop move back to d3, the queen and rook come into play. After captures and recaptures, and queen takes g3 occurs on the board, 
capturing the queen leaves me a piece up and on track to winning the game, black will likely lose the game entirely. In this version, we see that queen takes b7 is not possible, after the rook comes to c8 to control this file, I fearlessly play queen to b4 because queen c1 doesn't provide a decisive advantage for black, I can simply move my king to e2, and it's completely safeguarded with the bishop protecting that square. When black plays queen to a4 to attack the knight, I move back my knight. After capturing the bishop, I play knight to d6, eventually advancing to e5, creating a strong bond between the knights, the two knights in the center of the board create a problematic situation for black, leading to a decisive advantage for white, the rook can also come to h1 to check the king, even queen takes e4 becomes a threat, and your entire position is paralyzed. For example, if you play king to g7, I can play queen to c5, executing a heavier attack, and your entire position becomes frozen. Your rooks and queen are completely stuck due to my knights, making your position untenable, after black makes a queen check that seems unwise, and the rook moves to b8, I can play the knight g5 move to attack the queen, as the queen moves back, the knight subsequently moves to the e6 square, and the queen moves to c7 to check black, with no squares for the king to move except one, queen g7 leads to a disastrous checkmate, returning to the position, it's clear that your entire position is crumbling, and your king is unable to move, this is why ruby decided to play rook to f6, blocking the queen's invasion on the d4 square. After I capture your rook and a recapture occurs, queen f3 check is delivered, after a few more moves, we see rook to e1 and g4, followed by queen exchanges on the c3 square, as the game progresses, I have a material advantage and can win pieces from black, advancing my pawn to f7, I am clearly winning the game. The situation is highly favorable for me, and I promote a new rook, achieving victory over the opponent's rook in chess. What an impressive and spectacular game it was, I hope you thoroughly enjoyed the content, wishing you all the best, goodbye.